She is the richest Spanish galleon ever found in the Western Hemisphere. Nuestra Señora de las Maravillas sank with 650 souls and over $1 billion in gold, silver, and precious jewels. In the next half hour, we will explore the remains of the wreck and recover some of the lost treasure of the Maravilla, Our Lady of the Marbles. Off the Bahama Channel, the waters are crystal clear, calm, and for the most part give little indication of the catastrophe that sank the Maravilla. But it was in these emerald seas that the 650-ton galleon, the heaviest and largest of the King's fleet, met her fate in the year 1656. Were it not for the painstaking efforts of Captain Herbo Humphreys, the remains of the Maravilla and her cargo of treasure might never have been located. It was Captain Humphreys who, along with researchers in Spain, exhumed centuries-old documents pertaining to the wreck. Today, aboard the research vessel Beacon, aided by charts and documents, Humphreys has begun excavating the ocean floor, where he believes the Maravilla's mother load awaits recovery. And this goes back, I've got them going back to uh, 1583, second edition, new charts I got on this thing here, and I see once again, Maravilla. Art Hartman has been a treasure finder for nearly 30 years. His vessel, the Dare, and his expertise will be indispensable in the coming months as recovery efforts get underway off the Bahama Channel. What you want to do now, between this underwater buoy right there, that buoy right there, that little buoy right there, uh -huh. and those, those, uh, that, that group over there is, is the main hit. <clears throat> I tried it get it so you can get in between of them without catching the uh, in the uh, wheels. Okay, you don't know if it's deep sand or not, huh? I have no idea. I would have to think that's, that's an anchor or maybe a couple of cannons laying there. It's a uh, one heck of a lot of anomaly. Not only that, you see that other buoy way out there? See, that's towards that reef. Now, all through there, between here and that buoy over there, I got a lot of little light readings. And for some reason, Last year, I wanted to go in there and work. We never got the chance to get in there. But now, there's, there's some stuff in there. Treasure recovery is not without its fair share of hard work. Before divers make their first dive, hundreds of man hours are expended in grueling, hands-on toil. Many of the laborious elements of treasure diving have nothing to do with diving. This is the edge of the reef right here. Right. So I guess we ought to be back this side of it. So make your turn and head down and stay about, about 100 feet off of the edge so I can mag over towards the edge of the reef and on the other side, OK? One of the tools Hartman will use is an apparatus known as a magnetometer. By lowering a sensing device into the water, the mag will detect changes in magnetic fields giving Hartman a readout on a line graph. Uh, well, the magnetometer, you know, is an instrument that we have to track these ships with. And the Maravilla scattered, you know, well over uh, five, maybe 10 miles. So without this instrument here, you're just up the creek. We just, we just, we just got to do this day after day after day. It's very boring, but it's, we get it done. Hartman says 12-hour days of nothing but magging back and forth over mile after mile of ocean bottom is not unusual, and on this occasion, it happens to pay off. The crew of the Beacon, who will do most of the salvage work, jump into action.
before divers enter the water, the tons of coral and sand that have buried the Maravilla for the 331 years she's been lying on the bottom must be removed to allow divers access. This is done with an apparatus called a mailbox. It redirects the ship's propeller blast to the ocean floor. While the mailboxes are being lowered, the rest of the crew is busy anchoring the beacon's stern over the area of the mag hit. Soon the ship is positioned. The call is made to the wheelhouse for power, and below, the ocean bottom begins to boil. It is at just such times when the ocean bottom swirls with the ship's prop wash that much of the treasure is recovered. The research has paid off for the salvagers. Almost immediately, fragments are found. Pieces of pottery, ballast stones. As wayfaring stingrays glide by, Personal remains of the Maravilla's passengers and crew are found. A pipe, brass buttons. Then, like the bones of a long-buried skeleton, the ship's timbers appear just under the sand. Finding the timbers gives Hartman and Humphreys new resolve. They are sure now that they have found a large part of the hull, and they set about to search the surrounding area. It is the third day of the expedition. In less time than it has taken any of the previous salvagers, the Hartman and Humphreys team have already located the scatter pattern and are retrieving treasure. The divers feel confident they painstakingly search the area. A clump of coral or a mound of uncovered sand may hold a king's ransom. The divers have been down now over eight hours. Some have surfaced to eat or rest. The pressure of working on the ocean bottom begins to take its toll. But as is almost always the case in treasure finding, perseverance will win out. On the last sweep of the bottom with a handheld metal detector, the needle pegs. The diver fans the sand and finds the first of the Maravilla's silver. As if to tease the divers, like throwing a bone to a pack of hungry dogs, the Maravilla begins handing out pieces of her treasure. An uncut Colombian emerald is uncovered. Not even recorded on the ship's manifest, it will be the first of many emeralds the salvage crew will wrest from the ocean floor. Lying buried just under the sand, it is another indication that the Maravilla's treasure may yield more than the crew had anticipated. You got an emerald? All right. But soon even the emerald is overlooked as the crew again turns to the workaday business of treasure hunting. There is a sense on board the beacon that the Maravilla is toying with them and she is taunting them with a coin here, an emerald there. There is still no real indication that they are near the mother load or that the beams they have uncovered are part of the main hold of the ship. Beams would float, beams could scatter. To find the mother load, they would have to find cannon and large ballast piles. Again, almost on cue, Nuestra Señora de las Maravillas hands the divers a clue. Half buried in the sand, a mute reminder to her catastrophe, one of her anchors is found. It is decidedly a vintage anchor. Too small to be the Maravillas main anchor, this could be one of her stern anchors. Perhaps this is an anchor off one of the 17th century Spanish salvage vessels that worked on her for four years.
There is no way of telling what vessel this anchor may be from, though to the crew it is another important piece of the Matavia's vast puzzle. On this underwater desert lives a variety of marine life, none so abundant or eerie as the stingray. The beacon's mailboxes have blown the sand off the hard pan, uncovering thousands of crustaceans, which the stingray feeds on. Like an alien spaceship, several rays glide by, feeding off the freshly churned bottom. For the most part, these creatures are harmless, usually fleeing from man. Divers in the water scatter the rays. Again, the ocean floor belongs to the Matavia's ghost and the salvage crew. On this dive, divers begin retrieving large pieces of clay pottery. It was in pottery such as this that the Spanish stored much of their food. Divers exhume a vast array of artifacts. Soon, however, what seems to be a promising hole runs dry. Now the divers are finding only the Matavia's ballast stones, small ones at that. The grueling hours of pressurized work goes on. A small hit on one of the metal detectors sparks a flurry of activity. Again, the metal detector scores a hit. Soon, divers are digging through soft sand towards the source of the noise. They hit bedrock. Another pass of the detector indicates the source is buried under the hard pan. A diver surfaces, comes back with a crowbar. For the next hour and a half, the men will take turns banging, prying, and hammering at the coral to release the prize. A pass of the metal detector proves they are just inches away. Then they find it. As it will be on many a dive, the hours of work yield only a corroded cannonball. It will be this way for the entire trip. Divers will spend hour upon hour chipping, digging, sifting through tons of sand only to find a stray piece of iron. But even the cannonballs are valuable. Not only do they indicate the direction of the scatter pattern, but they bring high prices at auction. For the next day or so, the divers can seem to find nothing but iron. Dozens of coral-encrusted musket barrels are loaded onto the cage. Iron spikes, once used to hold the ship's timbers together, lie scattered everywhere. Again, the ballast rocks are bigger, fueling the hope that the salvage is nearing the mother load. With so many artifacts coming up, the airlift is summoned from the deck. It acts as an underwater vacuum cleaner, sucking sediment from the bottom, leaving the outfall to float through the water like new snow. Under the watchful eye of the diver, nothing is left to chance. No stone is left uncovered. But again, the hole runs dry. Nothing is left but broken coral, sand, rocks, and the ever-present barracuda. It is day five. The helicopter has been summoned from the mainland. Using the dare as landing pad, Hartman will fly aerial magnetometer surveys. A chopper will also be on hand for aerial reconnaissance, emergencies requiring medical evacuation, and airlifts of crew members to Grand Bahama. Flying in low circles over the shallow wreck site, the mag soon registers hits. However, aboard the beacon, the radio brings bad news for the salvagers. Weather reports confirm that a tropical wave has built off Cuba and is menacing the islands. Immediately, work moves into high gear. One of the disadvantages of naval salvage is that you are at the mercy of the weather. And so again, the beacon's engines stir, the sands part, and the divers descend. A hit on one of the metal detectors. A diver fans off sand, revealing a single blackened coin. Encouraged by the find, the other divers press on. Soon, another hit on the handheld detector and another coin. Working symmetrically from the center, divers begin reading hits scattered throughout the hole. Soon, clumps of coral-encrusted coins begin appearing almost magically from under the thin sand. It is as though Our Lady of the Marbles has taken pity on these sailors and is finally rewarding them. All the divers but one have risen topside to rest and examine the day's find. Diver Arnie Chevalier remains on the bottom. 
He has been a salvage diver for 10 years and has learned to trust his instincts. And Arnie has a feeling about this hole. Arnie uncovers what is perhaps the largest emerald ever found on a Spanish galleon. It is a monster 100 carats. On the auction block, it may bring as much as $2 million. A sailor's hunch has paid off, and a Spanish lady has consented to give him one of her most coveted possessions. The cage continues to raise artifacts and pottery as divers bring up more coins. Here, Kiel. Kiel. Garbage cans fill with stray pieces of conglomerate. The fragments will soak in fresh water for weeks before they are cleaned. On deck, the most promising pieces are carefully stripped of over three centuries of coral and corrosion. A clump of silver coins welded together with silver oxide over time become single pieces. Using electrolysis, other pieces are soon recognizable as musket barrels that 300 years ago may have fired on marauding pirates. The whole idea that can I cite out here that you're looking at billions of dollars, uh, you know, that is there. You know, every time we go down, we bring up a little something. For the crew of the Beacon, the expedition has become an adventure few people have experienced, and none will forget. Oh, it was a great experience. Of course, the real, the real pleasure is not in finding the treasure, it's in the hunt. The radio brings more bad news for the expedition. What yesterday was a tropical wave has now closed circulation. The storm threatens the beacon and the dare. Divers prepare to weigh anchor. Nuestra Señora de las Maravillas has toyed with the divers enough. Now she will endure yet another storm. During the summer's expedition, divers have managed to uncover millions of dollars in coins, emeralds, and other legacies of the past. The Maravilla still protects her main treasures. A solid gold statue of the Madonna and Child, a solid gold table encrusted with Colombian emeralds, as well as tens of millions of dollars worth of jewelry, coins, and precious stones from her passengers. The Beacon and the Dare weigh anchor and race past the Bahama Channel for safe anchorage. They will ride out the storm in Freeport, while La Maravilla, serene, patient, and mysterious, awaits their return. Out here, you just look around. Where do you look at? You know, it's a lot of ocean out here. Uh, but we will, we will find it. It's here, we will find it. The summer's expedition proved to be very successful. Millions of dollars in gold, emeralds, and artifacts were found, enough so that a museum has been built on Grand Cayman to house the Maravilla's wealth and legacy. The gin-clear waters of Grand Cayman were once home to pirates like Henry Morgan and Blackbeard. Grand Cayman is also home port for the Beacon, and it is on Grand Cayman that part of the Maravilla's treasure is to be displayed. Fittingly, along the very shores from which Morgan and Blackbeard once stalked Spanish galleons. For Captain Humphreys, the Maritime and Treasure Museum is the fulfillment of a lifelong ambition. The museum is a culmination of a lifelong dream I've had. This is a prototype. We hope to build many more if this works. Uh, what we hope to do with it is to show people that are unable to get out and dive to see what riches and treasures and time capsules lie under the oceans of the world. On display in the museum are dozens of uncut emeralds, along with hundreds of silver coins, as well as the personal artifacts of some of the Maravilla's crew, artifacts which, in Humphrey's view, serve as a looking glass into the past. It's just absolutely incredible that we have thousands upon thousands of totally intact time capsules that have never, ever been exploited in any way. When I say exploited, I mean to say looked at and preserved. Every screw, every nail that we find is preserved uh, for posterity. Outside the museum is perhaps the most historically valuable artifact, one of the Maravilla's anchors. To Humphreys, a symbol which reflects the success of the summer's expedition. 
This success could be best explained by the mere fact that this past summer we found three huge anchors, including the one that was allegedly bent in the collision of the Maravilla and the Capitana, the other ship in the flota or fleet at that time. Plus the extraordinary number of coins and emeralds, pipes, timbers, that if someone had found that before would not be there. If we keep at it like we're doing for the last two summers, I look for this coming summer for us to probably get into it real good, find a great deal more treasure than we found this year.